It's a great pleasure, pleasure to be here. It's actually only the second time I have been here. The last time I was here was uh, when I was still a grad student and I was doing some work with Steve and I was trying to prepare to bring Java back to Indonesia. So, yeah. um, so yeah, it's great to be here and the weather is great. I thought coming from California it would be like cold and snowy, but um, apparently you have much nicer weather here than in Boston <laughs> because the, my time in Boston so far, the winters have been crazy. Um, but let's get started. So yes, I would like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of the recent work that I've been doing uh, with my group um, on various things related to the formation of planets. Um, in particular, I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborator, my graduate student Niraj Inamdar at MIT, Peter Goldreich at Caltech, um, and I'm Sari, and I'm among uh, Jan Lelich at the Hebrew University. So um, what I'll be telling you about is various things related to the formation of planets in our own solar system and many of the extrasolar planetary systems that have been discovered. And I thought to set the stage, I will give you a very short, um, basically back of the envelope overview of um, the main stages we think planet formation um, passes through. So initially, um, everything starts with the formation of the central star and the disk that's forming around the star due to the axis angular momentum in the cloud that's collapsing. And in this disk, you have the formation of planetesimals, and that's still one of the very least well understood parts of planet formation. Um, but once we form planetesimals, um, it's been identified a long time ago that actually one of the first dynamic stages that's important in the growth, it's called uh, runaway growth. Um, in this stage, a small fraction of the total mass runs away in size, so it grows very quickly to much bigger sizes than the rest of the population, so it runs away in size um, from the rest. Um, it's characterized by a growth rate that's proportional to size, so the rate doubling is proportional to radius, so this, this scales with radius because the escape velocity goes with radius, so you have radius square, square divided by r, so you, you scales linear with radius, and so it means the bigger you are, the faster you grow. And of course, this happens in other astrophysical environments, um, in planet formation, this is achieved by increasing the actual accretion cross-section above the physical cross-section with the help of gravitational focusing. So the gravity of the body that's doing the growing can deflect incoming particles towards it gravitationally, and so it can grow uh, much faster because its effective cross-section is bigger than the physical one. It's kind of cute because it turns out that our Kuiper belt is very likely stuck in this stage of runaway growth. So it's, it's nice in the sense that we actually have probably a place in our solar system where we can t test some of these ideas of runaway growth. When bodies have grown to bigger and bigger sizes, um, eventually you transition to what's called oligarchic growth. So bodies are so big that they start dominating um, the material locally in their feeding zones. And um, you can ask um, how big can you grow by just locally accreting all that material, and that's been coined um, an isolation mass. And so you can add up all the material um, that is within the gravitational reach of the growing planet. Um, and if you calculate that in the outer solar system, you find that you get a mass that's roughly comparable to the mass of Neptune. Can you, can you yes. Explain what that is? Oh, sure. So, so in, in this one, so this is just, so, so this is the rate for dou doubling yourself in size. And then, so this is, so we can actually, I will derive it for you at the end of the talk if you like to stay. Um, but basically, <laughs> this is just the mass encountering rate. Um, so it's the little sigma is the mass surface density of the small body. Omega is the Keplerian frequency around the star. Rho is the mass surface density of the big bodies. Um, R is the radius of the big bodies. And V is the escape velocity from the big bodies that are doing the accretion. And U is the random velocities version of the small bodies. And so this would just be simply the collision rate if there would be no gravitational focusing. Um, and this is basically the enhancement you get due to gravitational focusing. Oh yeah, this is for one AU. Are you um, yes, at the end. Yes. Yeah. So, so, uh, basically, it takes about ten million years to reach isolation at one AU. This is the. Um, this is where it comes from. And 
And if you want to do it in the outer solar system, of course, the rates are much longer. And there are problems in the outer solar system um, forming uh, forming Uranus and Neptune, not so much in mass, but um, in terms of time scale. So you do need strong gravitational focusing to um, for, for keeping that. No, it's true. If you do it at 0.1 AU, it's about 10 to the 4 years. And it's still like in some major axis speed. If you that's right. I agree. The, it is the escape velocity. Because, yeah, so because the very end. So runaway growth for sure cannot last longer than that. We agree on this, right? And then whether or not you're in runaway growth depends on the relative regimes of the velocity dispersions of the big bodies and the small bodies. So there are two different cases where you can have it, right? There can be subhill where you can achieve it. In the yeah, and they can be super hill, but but um, it depends on whether the small velocities, the, the velocities of the small bodies, is stirred by the big ones, or if there's gas or something else that can do the damping, and that will determine how in which regimes you can have it. Um, but if you add up all this material in the feedings of an inner solar system and calculate the isolation mass, so this is simply two pi a is the some major axis times the width of the feeding zone, which is roughly the hill radius. So it's the the distance over which the gravity of a planet dominates over the tides from the sun times the mass surface density in the disk sigma, you find that at 1 AU, you only get roughly the mass of Mars. So although Uranus and Neptune may very well be something um, similar to an isolation mass, um, we know that the terrestrial planets, for them, this was not the final stage um, uh, for their formation. So for terrestrial planets, instead, we think they went through a diff an additional stage and planet formation called giant impact. And so we think that the Earth and Venus and so on, they're formed by the um, collision of a few dozen of those Mars-sized objects um, in giant impact. And uh, what is happening basically is once at about half of the material in the disk has been consumed into larger bodies, there's, they're no longer able to efficiently damp the velocity dispersions. Once there's no more damping, the gas is gone by this time. Um, the the protoplanets start to excite each other's orbits. You had orbit crossing, and you get giant impact. And so, of course, our moon is thought to have been uh, formed in the last giant impact that hit the Earth. And then there's one very last stage that's often forgotten, but it's kind of important, which is kind of the cleanup of the leftover planetesimals at the very end. Um, and it's important because um, A, giant impacts don't set in when most of them have consumed. There's still some bodies left over. Um, but it's important dynamically because you need something to circularize the orbits after the end, at the end of giant impacts, because otherwise you would expect pretty large eccentricities because you needed those eccentricities of orbit crossing in the first place. And then um, we also have geochemical evidence that there really was this phase of cleanup from highly solidified elements like iridium and osmanium that are found on the Earth for Mars and the Moon, which me and they are found on the surface or in the mantle, and they're highly solidified elements, meaning iron-loving. And the fact that they didn't end up in the Earth's core, um, because they would have loved to do that, um, is interpreted that they have been accreted after the core formation of the Earth, meaning after the last giant impact. And so we know that the Earth accreted about half to 1% of its total mass after the moon forming impact, so late in that sense. So it's kind of neat how the geochemical evidence and the dynamical need for having this leftover population fits in together. So then let me move on to exoplanets. So it is truly an exciting time thinking about problems related to planet formation. Um, because of this huge wealth of data that um, we've been receiving thanks to the Kepler mission. So um, as of to date, more than 4,000 planetary candidates have been reported, um, with more of 1,000 of those planets residing in multiple planet systems. The typical radius um, of these objects is um, a bit bigger than two Earth radii, and the median period is nine days, just from the observations. So what I'm showing you here is um, the, all these candidates. So this is 
radius in, in Earth radii and period in pounds of days. And every little blue point that you see on the plot is representative of one of those Kepler candidates. And then in comparison, I plotted here the solar system, so Mercury, Venus, and Earth. And then the red line corresponds to the radius of Neptune. So you can see that the planets and size are typically between the size of the Earth and Neptune, and their orbits are well inside the orbits of Mercury for most of them. So they are a very different beast from what we have known so far from our own solar system in the sense that in terms of size, they're a lot more like Uranus and Neptune, but in terms of orbit, they're are much closer to the sun than even our closest planet, uh, Mercury. Um, so we, of course, would love to know what's going on. Let me just add here that the fact that this region is empty here doesn't yet mean that the solar system is a true freak. Um, it, this is still, we do not yet know if this region is depleted or whether it's um, populated um, because um, basically sensitivity levels are not good enough yet um, to reach parameter space. So then, of course, the question is, given the brief overview I have given you in terms of planet formation, should we think of those planets really like super Earths in the sense that they're somehow like they're formed similar to terrestrial planets, close to where you see them, with got an impact, but somewhere in a super way that they were super big or much bigger on average? Or are the mini versions of Neptune or like Neptune, they're formed further away and then migrated to their current location? Or are there some kind of combination of these two ideas? Um, or do we have to go back to the drawing board? So, the, so I will try to address this question in various ways. The first thing um, that I would like to look into is actually the architecture of these systems. And then in the second part of the talk, I will be talking about the composition and what this tells us about their formation. So the architecture, what can we say about the orbital architecture? So as I said, there are more than a thousand planets that are actually in multiple systems. And so we can look at those and see if there are any clues um, to their formation in that information. So this is a plot of the period ratio of um, Kepler model planets, where you basically take the period ratio of all the different pairs that you have in a multiple system. And this plot was first done by uh, Dan Frabicki and his collaborators, this is just a, a new version of it. Um, and it's really interesting. So why did he decide to do this plot? What is interesting um, about it? And the, the, the thing that we're looking for, or they were looking for, is is there any dynamic structure in these systems? And so when you look at this, so this is just the period ratio of the different pairs, and then just a histogram of that. So n is just the number. And so I think the first thing that strikes the eye is that overall there's actually not that much structure in this plot. Um, and to guide our eye, um, the dominant mean motion resonances um, are drawn uh, for comparison. And so to first order, uh, what we see is that most planets are not in or near a mean motion resonance. And then if you look slightly more closely, you do see that some planets do know about these mean motion resonances. These are the lowest order ones that are drawn here. Um, Often there's some access just um, at slightly larger periods, like for the four to three or the three to two. And then even more puzzling for the two to one, there doesn't really seem to be an access, um, but there's this huge deficit just short of it. So it's like it's really missing the planets there. Um, so there, the first thing to observe is that most planets are not in or in motion resonance. Um, the two to one seem to be re depleted relative to the other resonances. About five to 10% of the planets do seem to know about these resonances, um, but then the two to one is, is depleted relative to the rest of the population. And then in addition, there is this offset from exact resonance of the order of one to 2%. And actually there has been quite a large body of work looking into that and addressing that. And so I won't be talking about this here further. I'm trying to focus on, um, on trying to understand why most of them are not in resonance. And then I'll mention a little bit about specifically the two to one mean motion resonance and its depletion. So what's the mean motion resonance? I'm sure you all know. Um, 
So the simplest of all resonances, um, of all the mean motion resonances, is two to one, where basically um, you have two bodies in the system going around a central star, and the inner planet will complete two orbits in the time in which the outer body will complete one orbit. And so whenever they basically meet together um, in the same location in the orbit. And these configurations can be stable over long, over long time. So how does it work dynamically? So what is happening is the following. So if those two planets, the outer one and the inner one, so here's my test, my essentially my test project case, you have an outer planet that's very massive on a circular orbit, you have an inner planet that's much, much less massive um, on the inner orbit. So if these two pan planets meet either at periap, so here or here, um, then the forces they experience just before and just after conjunction are equal and opposite and there's no, no net force, no net torque, so the angular momentum remains unchanged. However, if the conjunction is here, as I've drawn there, and I forgot to put together the nice laser pointer you gave me. Um, maybe this one works. Oh, yeah, this one does work. So you give me one as a present, but you know that your speakers are not organized enough to stick in the battery sometimes. So uh, you give one that works anyways. So here, so if you, look at the, if you look at the situation just before conjunction and compare to the case just after conjunction, you see that there's... Um, you have a slightly larger force just before conjunction because the separation between the outer and the inner planet is smaller compared to after conjunction, and also the duration of the encounter is longer because the inner guy is speeding up as it's going towards pericenter. So as a result, you have a larger um, tangential force before conjunction than after conjunction. So as a result, you increase the angular momentum of the inner guy, um, so you increase the period, and so next time these two meet, next time they have a conjunction, it will actually be slightly closer to pericenter because this guy will have had time to travel a little bit further um, for the next conjunction. And so this one had to, it took it a little bit longer to catch up with it. And as an exercise for the audience, you can repeat the same experiment, um, but having the initial encounter past periap, and you'll find that again, the next conjunction will be driven towards pericenter. So, when you, if you would only look at the times of conjunctions, you forget about the actual orbital motion um, and only plot the points when they meet, it will look something like this. I don't know why this is cool. So, and if, if this does look similar to you to a, to a simple pendulum, then uh, this is correct. So you can actually, although, you know, the resonant equations of motions are, uh, they can actually look rather complicated. Um, you can simplify them. And if you look at them in the right way, you can actually simplify them significantly and um, compare them quite well with a simple pendulum equation. So these are the resonant equations uh, that would describe these two planets. Um, and this is just a reminder, as I'm sure you all know, the equation of a simple pendulum and so when you just look at the angle of conjunction, um, you can really describe it um, as a simple pendulum with the additional complication that the length of your string and your pendulum is not constant, okay? The length of your string depends on whether you're going from left to right or right to left. And so um, this, this is accounted for in here, and it's actually proportional to the velocity because where it really comes from is from the Coriolis force because in this case, you're also all in the rotating frame going around the sun. So this is where this additional, this is why it's a banana, okay? Another, so I would need a magic string here. So a string that is longer when my pendulum goes this way and it's like shorter coming back the other way. But other than that, the dynamics um, are actually the same. So um, what is happening, so when something is caught in resonance, what is happening that these locations, um, in, so when things meet, are not random. So the angle of conjunction is, is, is not random in phase. And so this is, this is why you have the specific relationship. And you can be in exact resonance where you would just sit down here without any librations around equilibrium. Or you can have, you can be librating around this equilibrium point as I'm showing you here. Then um, if, you, if you solve these equations, you'll find that the solutions um, uh, essentially nested periodic orbit 
where how far you are away from resonance is just, is just um, proportional to or inversely proportional to the eccentricity. So the eccentricity of the orbit of the inner guy in my example case is proportional to how far you are away from exact resonance. Exact resonance meaning the exact two to one period ratio. And so um, what is happening if you include migration only is that two planets can approach each other they're caught in resonance, and because of this relationship, um, the eccentricity as the migration will push and push these planets closer together and closer to exact resonance, the eccentricity will grow, and they are <laughs> caught in resonance until the eccentricity has grown so large to order unity that it will escape. And so the expectation is then, if those planets formed in a disk and migrated, that you would get um, these planets to be caught in resonance, and they spent a long time in resonance, and um, because the thing that really breaks the resonance is the eccentricity growing to order unity. And so then, it, it's not surprising then that the time scale you would spend in resonance is comparable to the migration time scale. So comparable to the migration time, time that you spend migrating in between resonances. And that's why the naive expectation was that if those planets migrated in a disk um, to the small semi-major axis that they have today, that they would have they should all be in resonances, or a large fraction of the total population um, should be in resonances. You would expect these huge peaks at the mean motion resonances, and that's not what the Kepler data is showing us. Um, it's, well, in reality, they're not test particles, but it's very easy to um, relax that assumption and do it with two masses, and you, you will get the same result um, qualitatively. I'll say a little bit more about this um, in a few slides. Um, so what, what we did is actually, we thought, fine. Uh, so we were very intrigued by this because if it's true, then it really means that we can rule out this idea that these planets migrated inwards um, to their current location, or if they migrated, it must have something else really significant must have happened to erase the signature. But we realized that people had only looked at, included the effect from the gas disk, what's causing the migration, right? It's the planet's interaction with the gas disk. But the gas disk not only leads to migration, it only also damps the eccentricity. So as soon as you include migration as well as eccentricity damping in the equations of motion for this resonant interaction, you find, not surprisingly, that now they can exist in equilibrium, right? Because planets can grow, grow, go into resonance. The migration is pushing up the eccentricity, right? Because it's trying to push them closer to us. But now you include eccentricity damping that can damp the eccentricity. And now there's, a, there's this equilibrium. And so depending on whether this equilibrium value for the eccentricity um, is basically smaller or larger than nominal eccentricity um, the planet would have at the given resonance in the absence of any dissipation, you can I have three different outcomes. You can be permanently caught in resonance. You can liberate around that equilibrium value, or you can actually escape if, if the equilibrium value you are trying to grow to is past essentially the separatrix. So, yeah? Yes? Oh, so today, no. During their formation, of course, because as I'll show you later, they have, first of all, we, I think everybody is convinced that planets do form in just the context of gas and dust. I'm talking about their formation. Yeah, I'll, I'll, sh I'll uh, yeah. So the 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 naive expectation is, as I show you, that they will be frozen in and what it was. Um, but this is not related to the MRI. No, this is just the simplest thing where you have just the contribution from the gas um, disk giving you both migration and eccentricity damping due to the torque. Um, that the, the planet excites on the disk and then the planet's re back reaction, the disk back reaction on the planet. Scott worked out um, a large fraction of this. It's not the kind of study that the test was. Oh yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, we'll get to that. So let's first walk through the, to the eccentricity case. So it's not surprising there's an equilibrium. And so now you have these three options. Depending on, so it's it's easy to see, right, that the equilibrium eccentricity should be is a ratio of the eccentricity damping time scale to the migration time scale because of these two things that are competing. 
And then um, the other thing that is um, th that you can see is that there, whether or not you will grow or adapt in this equilibrium just depends on how large your equilibrium eccentricity is, which is given by this, compared to the nominal eccentricity the planet would have in that resonance if there would be no dissipation, so no eccentricity damping and no migration. And that's uh, basically just a function of mu, which is the mass ratio between the, the planet or the more massive planet to the star. So in the simple pendulum analogy, we have these three different cases. So the first one is where um, the equilibrium eccentricity is so low that basically your pendulum is damped. So you sit permanently in resonance, there's no vibration around it. The second case is where um, you actually excite the eccentricity and you get what we call these overstable vibrations, but they can be stable if they're bounded. And so that would be a pendulum just swinging like this forever. And then the third case is where um, you, you do get overstable vibrations. So basically, the destroying force, once you displace from equilibrium, the destroying force such that you're coming back to the equilibrium position with a velocity greater, a speed greater than you had originally coming out. In this case, you will excite these oscillations or the vibrations, and then you can cross the separatrix and escape. So um, the really neat thing is that we know which regimes this should happen because the the equilibrium eccentricity, as I said, only depends on the ratio of the eccentricity damping time scale to the migration time scale. And we know these. So we know that this ratio, it's on my next slide, but we know that this ratio basically is just given by the, the scale height of the disk divided by the semi is the aspect ratio, if you wish. And we know that observationally um, squared. So it's, it's roughly a factor of 10, so squared is roughly a factor of 100. So we know that value. Uh, reasonably well. So the very cute thing is that what you find then is, so for Jupiter mass planets, you find, so then whether or not you are in which of these three regimes you are, permanent capture, capture with librations or escape, only depends on how massive your planet is. So in the, the nice thing is, if you do that, you find that Jupiter mass planets will be captured in resonance and there, um, any librations would be damped and they would just be stuck in this resonance forever. So not as before, where the eccentricity would keep growing and eventually escape, they would just sit there happily ever after. And we actually have many examples. In fact, many of the very first radio velocity planets later had um, in, in, in resonance. And so DJ876 is, I think, the most famous um, example. And this is partly, I think, where our prejudice came from, why we expected all the exoplanets should also be in these resonances. Then. Um, if you're more like Neptune in mass, then uh, what could happen to you is you'll be captured in resonance um, and you're, you're, you're not damped to equilibrium, but you get your librations excited and you're liberating around equilibrium and you can stay there for a very long time or forever. So they're bounded. But if you go to even lower mass planets, the Earth or a few times the mass of the Earth, um, you find you're caught in resonance and then your librations grow and the growth is unbounded, and so you escape. And the, and the thing is that you escape on a time scale that's much shorter than the migration time scale. So the, the time scale for growth, the rate of growth of course is one over the eccentricity damping time scale. So the time scale that you spend in resonance is roughly um, the eccentricity damping time scale a few times that. And because the eccentricity damping is 100 times faster than the migration rate, you expect at any random moment in time only about 1% or a few percent of the systems should be in resonance compared to the time migrating in between them. So um, I just essentially said that. So then we ask, where do these Kepler systems fall, right? So here's our very naive. So this, let me stress, this is the restricted free body problem, just the two to one mean motion resonance. But this is our very naive prediction that um, this is the mass ratio of the more massive planet to the star. And this is the mass ratio of the two planets with respect to each other. If most of them fall down here, then they will be caught in resonance, but they will escape <coughs> again. So they, they, as a population, at any random moment in time, we should only see a few percent of these guys in resonance, if you take a snapshot of the system. 
the ones up here would be permanently captured. And once they are in resonance, they should stay in resonance. And the things that are in the sliver here um, could potentially undergo just finite amplitude growth and then uh, stay there. So this is where the Kepler systems fall. So actually, most of them are indeed low enough in mass uh, compared to the stellar mass that uh, we don't expect them to be permanently captured in resonance. In fact, there are ideal candidates for being um, captured and then uh, or subsequently escaping again on a short time scale, on the eccentricity damping time scale. And then you can do one more thing. You can then ask which one of those are in or near the two to one um, mean motion resonance. And you can see, so these guys, I would say, are permanently captured and they probably have been there and will stay there forever. Um, and then these guys here, they just happen to be in this location as they were passing through when the disk dissipated. And the reason why this result, see, since you were asking, um, is independent of when and how the disk dissipated and why um, you may expect it to be a representative of this early stage is the fact that it only depends the outcome in this case only depends on the ratio of the eccentricity damping time scale and the migration time scale. So it, and, and basically the details of the disk will cancel out. So they're, they're, it, they're independent of how exactly the disk is lost, um, you, you would expect to preserve this because it only depends on the ratio, not on the total mass of the disk or other parameters. So. Well, if they, there was never a disk, they couldn't have formed because they have large amounts of gas in the envelope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Sure. Now, no, but we know there was one early on. Yeah. Yes. 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 In migration, they go together, yeah, right? Migration, yes. Exactly. Yes. because we don't know of a way to change it. I will tell you in a, in a second that there are some ways of changing it, but naively, if the disk goes away, because it only depends on the ratio, so it depends both on the incident and the migration rate, once the disk has gone away, there's not much left to modify it. And while the disk go is going away, you expect this to be preserved because the, the it affects both of these timescales in the same way together. Yeah, mostly. Yes. No, no, no. So they are. Sorry. Yeah, that's an excellent question. No, actually, um, the, the masses actually are not that precisely known. So the masses um, are just estimated from their radii using the mass radius relationship that has been inferred from the few radio velocity measurements that we have for the Kepler system. No, they're not assumed. They're rocky. So the mass radius relationship has been from rocky to. That's right. Yeah. And it has been measured fairly well now. So, you know, there's surely uncertain within factors of two easily, but I don't think it matters for the overall picture at least. So I think, um, so n this will n naively explain why most planets are not in the two to one mean motion resonance. And, and because planets only spend a small fraction of their time migrating through it, um, actually, the number of, if you want to do the statistics, counting the green points, comparing to the blue points, is actually consistent with a few percent you would expect. So when we, um, so let me just summarize this. So I think we, so I think we actually were the first one to discover and characterize this new resonance behavior. At least we weren't able to find it anywhere in the literature. Um, and this is this feature of these overstable vibrations that you can have when you have both a migration and eccentricity damping together. Um, we were a bit puzzled that there weren't, people hadn't found it numerically in the literature, at least in the past. We did find one paper by um, Jack Wisdom um, and Jenny Meyer that um, looked at Enceladus, that's why I have Enceladus there, and I think they saw it actually in some of the numerical simulations. Um, and that reminds me to tell you that um, this has many applications, of course, it's not restricted to extrasolar planets. Um, so for any systems in which you have dissipation for both eccentricity damping and migration. And the key um, for this 
to happen is that you damp the eccentricity at almost constant angular momentum. That's es essentially what's driving this instability. I think, um, so originally we thought this will explain single-handedly the overall um, shortage of planets in resonance. Um, however, although it works extremely well for the two to one mean motion resonances, and I think it, this is the reason why the two to one is so depleted compared to the three to two and four to three and so on and so forth, um, it's not sufficient to explain uh, the overall um, shortage of planets in resonance, especially for the high, for the three to two and four to three and so on and so forth. And it's because um, additional work, partly by ourselves and other people who extended this, um, showed that for higher order resonances, you tend to spend, you still have the overstable vibrations and you escape, but you spend more and more time in resonance before you escape. So you don't escape on the eccentricity damping tends to scale but a few times. And those few times can be 10 times or so. So you actually have to um, uh, look at this slightly more carefully. So what I think is happening is this, that, so I think the two to one is depleted just because of that. However, the overall lack of planets in resonance is, um, um, my best guess is, is given by the fact that you do form these tightly packed systems in these chains, but once the gas goes away, the system actually is no longer stable. So you're able to form these very tight systems um, because you had all this gas damping. Once the gas goes away, um, the system will undergo, especially you have many tightly packed systems, will over undergo an instability and you'll have, you know, on, on tens of millions of time scales, one or two large giant impacts, here's an example, where you basically go from five or six tightly packed planets to three or four. Um, and that then would offer you an explanation why um, most planets are not in resonance um, and a few of them will be because these were the ones that didn't have, you know, these, because you don't need to collide all of them to achieve long term stability. You only have to merge one or two of these masses. Uh, you mean in resonance ratio? Mm -hmm. They're not in resonance right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly their ratio from the thing. Yeah. Okay. Yes. No, so this is not about the offset. Okay. Um, yeah. Actually, Scott and one of his students has a nice paper about it. There are several other. So basically, I think. Um, so the overall stable vibrations help you because you already have a large vibrating amplitude and a significant eccentricity more than you would expect. And if you would then damp that eccentricity, um, you can increase, have a large offset from resonance. And most models that have been put forward um, in the past appeal to that. Uh, so to some kind of scenario where you have um, something in resonance and then you damp the eccentricity and that can give you a large separation from excess. Uh, but this, yeah, we didn't address this point specifically. And um, I think the overstable vibrations help you because they allow you to have a bigger offset than without them. Um, but many people have looked at that before um, we did this work. So then, um, so because of this, and the other thing is, I think it's actually not so critical of whether those planets actually formed very far away and migrated significantly or just um, locally a little bit, um, most likely the interaction with the gas spheres will lead to tightly packed systems that are strongly damped. So I think having like a late type instability may, may actually be quite common. So because of these collisions, we started asking ourselves, what is the effect of collisions and giant impact on composition? Both actually for terrestrial planets and all these extrasolar planets. So, and by composition specifically, um, we had in mind the atmosphere because for the extrasolar planets, that's really what we can measure well and easily. It's like how much bigger the radius is than it would be for a purely rocky planet. Um, and for the Earth and the terrestrial planets, we know the atmospheres quite well. So it's kind of an interesting question, right? Where they come from, why are they the way they are? So how do you lose the atmosphere and how do you get the atmosphere? So Impacts come in two different flavors. They are giant impacts um, and they're small planetesimal impacts. The key difference is that in a giant impact, you have an impact that's so big that the impact tur launches on, on the collision, launches a strong shock that propagates to the entire planet 
that leads to a global ground motion of the surface of the planet, if you wish to think about it that way, and then that launches a strong shock into the atmosphere, and then um, all or a fraction of the atmosphere can escape um, depending on how to what velocities it will be accelerated to. So if it reaches, if a fluid passes through the atmosphere, reaches a velocity above the local escape velocity, it's lost. This is a really beautiful problem because it's essentially identical um, to one that has been solved a long time ago in the context of supernova explosion. So it's just a strong shock traveling through either an isothermal or adiabatic um, atmosphere. And it's beautiful because the solution is self-similar, the second type, self-similar solutions. And so you can essentially do this entire problem analytically. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. So you can calculate. <laughs> well, it was like the very old, you know, the very first like type 1A application of before, oops, so my computer didn't like your comment. It's like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, we're back. Uh, so it's kind of, it's a kind of a cute thing. It's, and so we, I didn't have to do that much work for it because people had more or less already done it. Uh, we just had to apply it to a slightly different scenario. Um, then there's a second regime for planets, not for supernovae or any other, as far as I know at least, um, <laughs> um, where you have smaller impacts. And smaller impacts, they can't do this trick. They can't launch a shock that's so strong that you could lose the atmosphere globally. But what the small impacts can do quite well is they can eject atmosphere locally. And what they do is they will hit the ground here. Again, you get something analogous to um, to first order to a point like explosion, and then you can ask um, whether or not you have enough, essentially momentum, to eject the material along this axis um, in any other direction. And so this basically gives you, you can calculate this way, the smallest impactor that can eject any atmosphere, and that's just given by um, the, <laughs> the mass of the impactor where the or this angle is given by where the mass per unit solar angle um, is given by the impact and mass divided by 2 pi because you assume it's like um, equally um, isothermal, well, spherically symmetric uh, across the impact site to first order. You can actually account for different angles, but once you average over all impact angles, you get the same results. So you can save yourself the trouble. So for the Earth, you just calculate how much mass is in this column and then ask what impact uh, masses corresponds to given that in my explosion or my impact, I can't just eject, I can't just put all my momentum in this direction, but I have to um, distribute it homogeneously in all directions. Um, you find that it's roughly a kilometer. So impacts are smaller than a kilometer are not able to eject any of our current atmosphere. If you're bigger than a kilometer, you can eject just about the material um, that's vertically upward because it has a small um, atmospheric column. Um, and then if you get bigger and bigger in size, you are able to eject a bigger and bigger fraction of this space. The biggest you can do is ejecting all of the tangent plane, so all the atmosphere that's above the impact plane. Um, and once you're about 25 kilometers for the current Earth, you are in that regime. Yeah, so in this case, um, I think of them as rocks. They're more like planetesimal. Um, so they don't have atmosphere, but I will give them volatiles in a second, and then it gets very interesting. But the velocity is just the, the Yeah, so here I, we just assume it's just the escape velocity. And you're right, so if you, it's actually a great question, if you give them some additional velocity at infinity, then you can even go to smaller sizes, of course, and still get some ejection. Yeah, it's, it scales quite nicely, actually. Yeah, so there is atmospheric loss due to um, photo evaporation from the, from the sun. And for exoplanets, that's even more important because they're closer to the star. I will mention that at the end, but here we are mainly concerned about the con contribution of impacts. So then you can do this big picture overview about impacts. What do they do? So they're the really small impactors. These are the ones that only do a fraction of the tangent plane. Then there are the ones that can eject all of the tangent plane. And then there are the giant impacts. And if you ask 
per unit impact of mass, which ones are the most important ones, which are the most efficient ones in ejecting the atmosphere, you find it's the small ones, the small ones rule. So what I'm plotting here is the total mass you would need an impactor to eject the current Earth atmosphere. And you only need, so does anybody know how much mass we have on the current Earth's atmosphere? Yeah, so it's, it's a few times 10 to the minus 6. Um, so it's one millionth of our mass. It's nothing. Um, but it's, of course, very important to us. And, <laughs> and we have about 10 to the minus 4 in the ocean, if you want to count that. Um, so if you just ask how much do you need to eject the current Earth's atmosphere, this is this line. You only need a few times that in impact of mass if you, can, if you have those bodies in kilometer size, a few kilometer size things. And the reason why it's so efficient is because they locally, they waste the least energy and momentum because they just eject the atmosphere locally. And the, the more you do, um, the better you are off, as long as you're not too small to do any damage whatsoever. Yeah. What, what is the y-axis? So the y-axis is just the total mass needed. Com yeah, to eject the current Earth atmosphere. Okay, so so it's the cur it's our current Earth. So you, you just assume what we have today. Yeah. So just what we have, um, and what matters the most is the mass. So this is how much impact and mass needed compared to the mass of the Earth to eject the current Earth atmosphere. So you only need a few times ten to the minus six in terms of impactors of the mass of the Earth in terms of impactors to eject the current Earth atmosphere, which is about 10 to the minus uh, 6. Okay, so it's factor of 5 inefficiency if you want to think about it that way. If you, if you are restricted to larger bodies, you need more mass because here you need a fixed number of impactors, n. So basically each impactor bigger than about 20 kilometers can eject the tangent plane of the impact site so you can just count how many tangent planes do you have on your planet, and that's how many bodies you need. It's the same number of bodies, and so the total mass just scales as the mass of the impactor. So the scale, or if you wish, the radius cubed. So that's why you have the slope here. So you always have the same number of bodies to lose all of the atmosphere, but you, you, the bigger your impactors are, the more mass you need, just because the number is constant. And the least efficient way of losing the atmosphere is giant impacts because you really need to collide with something comparable to yourself um, to, ha to create a strong enough shock that can travel through the entire planet and still have enough momentum to launch a shock that can lose the atmosphere on the other side. So it's very, it's very wasteful if you want to think about it that way. Although people have focused on this um, most strongly, trying to understand the Earth's atmosphere history, especially in the context of the moon forming impact. But most of the mass yes. Um, no, not necessarily, right? We don't know. No, it isn't mass to our size. Uh, it, it is today. It's it's close to that. Uh, for the Kuiper belt, I don't think we really know. But it's roughly equal mass to lower mass then. The thing that I would say to you is that this is so little mass, 5 times 10 to the minus 5. We know that the Earth secreted 1% after the moon forming impacts, and not such big impacts because we didn't go extinct and we don't have any evidence. And 1% is up here. So having. 10 to the minus 5 in small bodies, and we know that the Earth accreted 1% after the moon forming impacts, I think, it's, I think it's almost guaranteed that we had, if you actually ask, um, if you take the current, um, Im if you use the impact history from the moon and ask um, what implication it had for the atmospheric mass loss of the Earth, um, you find that um, th these are more important than any. We also know it had a giant impact. That's right. So it's what really the it had many giant impacts, in fact. And so um, to explain the overall, um, for example, isotopic ratios, you can't neglect the giant impacts. Um, but the co overall contribution is probably actually bigger from the smaller ones than from one or two big impacts. So I'll show it. So. So if you want to ask or understand at least the, the, the atmospheric history of the Earth, planetesimal impacts regularly dominated the atmospheric mass loss. Um, but we know for sure that there were um, events interspersed uh, from you know, the giant impacts uh, that the Earth formed from. 
It's just that these continued even after the moon forming impact. Yeah, excellent question. So um, there's actually much less known about the early Earth atmosphere than I thought. Um, the bi biggest constraints actually come from isotopic ratios of both the Earth, Venus, and Mars. And they all show that um, the Earth atmosphere looks like it has been depleted about um, 100-fold compared to Venus. If you look at just at the isotopic um, ratios of noble gases that should not have been altered in any other way. And Mars's atmosphere should have been, it looks like it's been depleted 10 to the 4 times. No, not for the terrestrial planets. Yeah, so the, the reason why this is, is, so for the terrestrial planets, although we don't have a good reason why, the, the planets, it looks like they formed essentially after the gas disk has gone, or essentially they did not accrete um, a lot of gas from the primordial disk. We have no evidence for that. Although for the extrasolar planets, the picture is very different. And I'll come to that in a second. So, so the current Earth's atmosphere um, has been strongly modified by both plate tectonics and volcanism, which basically releases some of the, um, some of the um, hydrous, the water that's been accreted as part of hydro mineral, hydrous minerals and so on and so forth can actually be released and recycled um, into the atmosphere. And so um, it's, we can't think of our current atmosphere as a primordial atmosphere in any way. And of course, the emergence of life has, has modified it as well, but even, even before that. So, um, but of course, uh, so probably what happened is you had, if you started off with some atmosphere, you would er erode it with impactors um, until a given impactor delivers with it a enough volatiles that you reach an equilibrium. So we, what we think probably happened is that the Earth's primordial atmosphere and that, you know, of Venus uh, and Mars, it was probably set by a competition between erosion and delivery. And it's actually not clear whether you started with quite a bit of atmosphere and you rode it to this equilibrium value, you started with none and you kept delivering until you reached this equilibrium value. But essentially, it will be established by impactors delivering with them enough volatiles that whatever they eject is compensated by whatever new material they deliver, at least in terms of volatile fraction. And you get very reasonable numbers depending on uh, what you assume for the volatile fraction of the impactors you have. So this plot is here to remind me of two things. The first thing is this gives you the mass ejected in a given impactor divided by the impactor mass. So you can again see that the small ones are the most efficient ones. They are, they are about 20%. So given of what they, um, compared to their own mass, they can eject about 20% um, of the atmosphere. And then it gets, they're less efficient as you go to a larger sizes. And this is a simple analytic um, result of that. And then these orange points are actually from some numerical simulations that simulate these impacts. Um, so we think for the Earth and the other terrestrial planets, this competition between erosion and delivery um, likely um, resulted in the exception of the initial conditions. And there is, one second, there's one really nice thing about this um, is that s even small initial differences in the primordial atmosphere can give you quite different end results. So if for example, Venus's atmosphere is 100 times more massive than the Earth's today. But they don't have to have had this big difference initially because once you're able to deplete the first half of the atmosphere, the second half is much easier, right? Because the smallest, the smallest size that can deplete any atmosphere um, is, is dependent on how much atmosphere there is. So once you start depleting the first half, the next half will be easier because you can use even smaller bodies depleting um, this original atmosphere, provided that you had these bodies. Um, but usually the smaller bodies are expected to be no more numerous. You could actually start off with somewhat similar initial atmospheres. They would have to be different by a factor of a few, um, but you couldn't get two very different results if you were able to deplete half in the first case and, and avoid that from happening in the second because it is a few times more massive. You can end up with one planet being essentially completely depleted in its atmosphere and the other one essentially holding on to almost everything. So 
no, no, that was that's absolutely right. That's right. So that that you're absolutely right. So this would would explain. So they would argue that maybe Earth and Mars um, were depleted to some equilibrium, and Venus would have maintained something close to its um, original um, amount, at least in atmosphere. You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. So this is just the primordial equilibrium before you start including any additional geochemical outgassing. And it's it's tricky. So that's why people go back to these isotopic ratios because the noble gas isotopic ratios are supposed to infer how much original atmosphere there was because they're not supposed to be affected by the outgassing rather than the total amount you had. You're absolutely right. So the Earth atmosphere is a much more complicated problem um, because uh, where do we think our current atmosphere comes from? A large fraction is from outgassing. And so that's actually from material that wasn't, that was accreted um, probably as hydrous minerals and not as um, some gaseous. Uh. So this is also why none of my colleagues well, can tell me. So it's, it, so it, it's, it sets the initial condition from which then the atmosphere would evolve due to outgassing, volcanism. Oh, so the outgassing then is what then the atmosphere. That's right. Yeah. It's like if you want like the initial point before I would give this problem to my, to my Earth colleagues who worry about the evolution of the Earth once I think I have formed it. Were you hoping to have some of the questions? Um, some of them, yes. Yeah. So it's, so, well, some of them they will say they don't know. But so, for example, the mag the yeah. So some of them you know for sure they're longer, and some of them. So we know that there was liquid water on the surface of the Earth, um, you know, within a few hundred million years. So it gives you like several hundred million years between the the moon forming impact and basically. Uh, but the early Earth is actually very poorly known, much poorer than I thought. Okay, so let me hurry up because I would very quickly at least tell you about the last part. Um, and that's applying this to giant, to giant impacts to exoplanet atmosphere. So in contrast to the terrestrial planets, um, the Earth's atmosphere where, you know, we have essentially no mass in our atmosphere, although it's very important, and our scale height basically doesn't contribute anything significant to our overall radius. The story for exoplanets is, of course, very different. And so we have many cases where the radius is a significant fraction. The radius and hence the atmosphere of the planet has to um, be significant because otherwise you could not explain large radii for the observed masses. And so what um, my student um, um, did is to ju see if we can explain some of those observations in the context of these giant impacts. So if you had a late giant impact, what would it do to the atmosphere? So the thing that we were intrigued by is this observation. It's the fact that if you calculate the bulk density, so the average density of your planet, that the following picture emerges. is that you have a large spread, more than an order of magnitude, in density for a given mass planet. So, so here, if you pick, for example, seven or eight Earth masses, you have densities that range from five grams per centimeter cubed to, to 10. And then the, the, the big points are the ones that are statistically more significant, so the plot is easier to read. Because if you plot the error bus, you mainly see error bus. And, uh, so we were intrigued by this. So initially we thought, oh, maybe it's just a fact of photoevaporation. The planets are close to the star, so maybe it's just the, the star stealing away the gas. But if you look at that, you see that, so this, this the missing low density planets here, surely are a um, result of photoevaporation because they receive high, high flux, so this is compared to the Earth's flux, um, and so you can strip their envelopes. But you see that big spread even for lower stellar fluxes, and it's, it, it's large. So the fact that they are missing here is probably a signature of that, but that just photoevaporation alone is, is most likely not the explanation for this wide range in density. So the colors is just how much flux they receive, so how hot they are. Yeah. Yeah, so these colors are the same as here. Second. So there are at least the escape velocity, um, and then probably up to maybe twice that 
because they probably won't, are not stirred to a velocity much larger than that um, just dynamically in the disk. That's right. That's a good question. Um, we don't know. So for the exoplanets, we, ex we have to ignore the small ones because the atmospheres are so massive that the small ones become insignificant. They can't remove in a single, if you calculate the size of a small impactor that can remove any atmosphere, you're already in the giant impact regime. Because here we have planets that have one to 10% of the total mass in the atmosphere, not 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus four, okay? So for the exoplanets, we're in this other regime. You're dominated by giant impacts. So these are the impacts you have to think about. So he then looked at how much atmosphere you can lose in a giant impact. And so he parameterized it here is the ratio of the impact velocity to the escape velocity of the planet, and then the function of the mass ratio of the two planets. And so for comparable mass impactors, um, we find that you typically lose around half, this is the atmospheric mass of it, you roughly lose half of the original envelope. And let me just move on. So the, the conclusion is, the, is that a single collision can easily reduce the total um, mass that you have in the envelope by uh, factors of two. So you can reduce the total envelope mass by a factor of two. And then the question is, what do, how does this translate to in the overall bulk mean density? And so we had to evolve those planets over time to see um, how changing the envelope fraction um, changes um, the radius that you would observe today, because of course we don't observe them when this impact just happened. Um, and if you do that, we find that um, this reduction of the envelope mass by a factor of two leads to a change in mean density of planets observed today of, of a factor of two to four. So a single giant impact can change the bulk density of a planet by factors of two to four. So we think that the large spread in these um, exoplanets, um, bulk densities may be due to just a single or maybe two of these giant impacts. That would be enough um, to give you this large spread. And this is um, especially appealing for systems that have multiple planets, multiple planets, for example, Kepler 11, 20, 36, and so on and so forth, where you have five or six planets that are tightly packed um, that display very different densities, often, uh, Often this cannot be explained just by photo evaporation. And the only other way that you would have to kind of appeal to explaining them being so different is by having locally different conditions in the disks. And that's um, kind of hard to see for a system that's so closely packed. Um, so it seems easier to us that maybe just, you know, by having some of those members having undergone a merger, um, that you can get a big diversity in densities without having had extremely different conditions locally in the disk. Sorry, say again? That's right. Yes, that's right. So the, actually the idea is that by the disk going away, the, the disk that's dominated by hydrogen and helium. So what is happening is you, form, you can form a system that's very tightly packed dynamically and it's stable as long as the disk is around. Then the disk goes, because the disk was providing a lot of damping. So it's preventing the, basically the eccentricities of these, of these planets to um, be excited by each other's gravitational perturbations. Then the gas goes away and as the, once the gas is gone, the, the planets start to excite each other secularly and the system is no longer stable and that will give you the collision. So these collisions here happen after the gas disk has gone. And so this is why you have always a net loss of atmosphere rather than any additional accretion that you can do. So the, the so, so planetesimals are usually too small to hold on to any significant envelope. Yes. 
Yeah, excellent question. I thought about this problem quite a bit. Um, uh, I th I, so I think, it, to me it looks like the reason why you get these impacts is slightly different, at least in the picture that I'm presenting you here. Because here I'm suggesting that you form these tightly packed systems in the presence of gas, and that gas may have played a role of even making them as tightly packed from the beginning. Um, because it is both pushing them together and damping the eccentricity so to keeping that system stable. And so when the gas goes away, it becomes unstable because this damping has gone. Um, and then the main mechanism um, is secular excitation. And I think there, typically only one or two giant impacts are sufficient. Per planet, probably one to two at most are sufficient to stabilize the system because you're started with already a small number of large bodies. Whereas, at least the picture I presented you for the terrestrial planets, the giant impacts start in a slightly different way in the sense that um, you had a larger number of bodies um, in the disk, and at least the initial excitation may be closer to, to just their mutual steering, which then later, the last collisions certainly are just secular, because that's how the system becomes stable, right? They separate out enough that um, secularly, they still feel each other, but not enough to significantly excite their eccentricities. So um, my guess, at least in these two pictures, um, because we had nothing that super tightly packed the terrestrial planets, um, so they just grew locally by accreting their material. In that picture, I would expect the exoplanets to have fewer and the terrestrial planets to have more. But if you, um, if you would, for example, ask, let them grow in feeding zones. I think even then, I think, and then I agree with you, I would, ask, I would argue that the exoplanets had fewer because if it was analog, analog to the terrestrial planets, you would say, you grow them in their feeding zones, which are roughly separated by the hill radii. The isolation masses are a larger fraction of the total mass you can get to with giant impacts because, as you said, the, the escape velocity is a smaller fraction of the orbital velocity. So in that case, you would expect fewer. So yeah, I think it, it depends on how you think you assemble them. If you translate the true analogy from the terrestrial planets to those exoplanets, you would expect uh, fewer for those exoplanets because they're closer and because you are limited to roughly the escape velocity. Um, yeah, so if there's nothing else that can super pack you or give you a lot of additional damping. Um, yeah, the surprising thing is that for the terrestrial planets, it seems like the formed essentially in the absence of gas, so we can understand the formation, um, you know, just ignoring the presence of the gas just altogether. And it's, it's a bit surprising that there's so little trace of, of the presence of, of the disk in our terrestrial planets, and we don't really know, I think, why that is, you know, what, um, what happened. So I'm sorry, I'm a bit over time, but I'm happy to take more questions if, uh, uh, if there are more. <laughs> uh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>